Welcome to Gate Crashers, a podcast dedicated to kicking open the door to your next favorite thing. Our mission, our creed, and our code is this, to make all things nerdy more approachable and accessible for everyone. We want to help you find a universe that you're going to fall in love with. I'm Dan, I use he, him pronouns, and today I'm joined by Becky Coonan and Michael Conrad, the current writers of Wonder Woman and Midnighter at DC Comics. How are you? I'm doing great, Dan. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having us on. I love that intro, by the way. I have to say, I'm all about it. I yeah, I don't think I've ever s- spoken so fluidly. Uh, <laughs> so to hear somebody be able to actually string together words in a in a meaningful way, and to have it be um, something that I can can understand is really see. Even now, <laughs> I can't even compliment you without stuttering and stammering. I'm a he him as well. Becky is a she I'm, her. Yeah, I'm she her. Let's rock and roll. Let's let's get into it. So um, I know you both know that I'm kind of a hard hitting journalist. So I always like to open our interviews <laughs> with kind of a right hook. Um, what's your favorite sandwich? <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, let's see. First, cheese and pickle. So it's delicious. Um, explain explain everything yeah. that's involved in there. Okay, there's two different types of cheese and pickle sandwiches. There's the American cheese and pickle sandwich, which is just like bread your condiment of choice your cheese of choice pickles maybe lettuce if you we're talking about yours in particular i think but then in the uk there's the the british pickle which is branston pickle which is totally different from like an american dill which is my pickle of choice very important the dill the crispy (laughs) dill the we like grillos in this house. We eat grillos pickles. Grillos pickles. Um, but the Branston pickle is more of like a sweet relish. So it's totally different if you're having a cheese and pickle somewhere else outside of North America, I suppose. Um, the other one is peanut butter and jelly. Very, you know, I like a good amount of both. And then I also, if, if possible, potato chips on the inside. And I like it on one piece of bread folded in half. I don't like it on two slices of bread. It's too much. One, one slice was, of bread. Wow, you were so decisive with that. I, I think I was trying to cue Becky to to share that we're vegans, so we oh, have yes, we cheese are vegans. that we eat. Yeah. Is like, it's, it's not as awesome as regular cheese. Like, yeah, we, and this is coming from a vegan. It, it tastes kind of like cheese. It's cheese-ish. It, you can get a good melty cheese. Like, if you want a grilled cheese, I think vegan technology is at a point where you can have, like, a good like American slice, like not actually cheese slices we're talking. Michael's been vegan since we were like 13 or something. Um, wow. And I kind of fell into it gradually over time by cutting out meat, you know, as you do with like, oh, I'm going to only eat meat on weekends or like now I'm only going to eat meat if I'm away at a convention and then like cutting it out slowly. And then finally we became vegan fully or me anyway like three years ago i'm guessing yeah so it's, it's been a minute it's, yeah it's kind of second nature for us and it hasn't been difficult <clears throat> so that's it's great actually that's... i love that your sandwiches are so simple and so you're so i love sandwiches we're from a really kind of blue collar mill town in southern new hampshire we both grew up together <clears throat> like in the same in the same small community and those are very much um, kind of representative of kind of where we're from. Is like, <laughs> oh, you got you got these handful of ingredients that have been hiding in the back of the fridge. Chuck them together in between some bread, and and there's your sandwich. Yeah. Uh, oh, a crucial component of the vegan cheese and pickle sandwich is nutritional yeast. A little sprinkle of the nooch. It's just it's the great. Nooch. The nooch. the nooch yeah you love it <clears throat> for me i think i'm a little bit more um i don't know gluttonous <laughs> I, it's less about um it's less about what's in the sandwich and more about the size 
and caloric content. <laughs> I'm just, I'm a big dude, like in terms of height, primarily. I'm a, I'm a pretty tall guy. And I sometimes will like be embarrassed about how much I like to eat. And then Becky will say, no, you're, you're big. You need, a, you need a lot more fuel than I do. Because how she was saying she likes the peanut butter and jelly being on one piece of bread folded in half. That ain't happening for me. I'm doing the full sandwich. And I, this is going to be gross for some listeners. I like to get, in our case, non-dairy butter, margarine, as some people like to refer to it. Smear that on the bread. Then put the the penis butter on there, and then <laughs> then put the jelly in there. And if you got chips, pretzels, anything that crunches, throw that in there too, and make a basket of fries. Well, then you put and the, call for a pizza. Yeah, then he puts the sandwich in the fridge. You gotta let it age, and then it ages <laughs> in the fridge. You got for, it. okay. So he puts the sandwich in the fridge, and then. He will. It's called a thrice denied peanut butter and jelly you have because to you deny it, it three times. Like the first time you look at it, it's not ready. And then the second time you open the fridge just to kind of mull around and see what's there. Oh, peanut butter and jelly, gotta, not ready. You got to edge your way toward it. You yeah. got to. It, it's about waiting. It's about in sweet anticipation. You look at it, preferably it's wrapped in wax paper as like maybe somebody that loved you made you a sandwich to bring in your little bag to school. And you've been looking at it for the first couple hours of your day thinking, man, I'd like to eat that sandwich. It's capturing that elementary school hunger that a young Michael carried with him in his, in his head and heart. And it's bringing it into adulthood <laughs> at a time where maybe I can have, I can have a PB and J anytime I want, but denying myself that the thrice denied thrice 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 denied i the thrice denied pb and j i wonder how i'm gonna make a recipe book of peanut butter and jelly sandwich recipes we and had a challenge one time and i think uh i think i believe that i won i thought i won Becky knows that she won <laughs> i thought i was the winner of that challenge but i don't know maybe you can win though if you want yeah, yeah. and one day when all this covid is cleared up and it's safe for everyone and we can all get together. Uh, I'm gonna make sure that we find a, a way to be able to each of each each of us will prepare you if it's dietarily within reason for you. If you're allergic to peanuts or something, uh, shoot me an email. We'll find like a cashew, but I, I don't know if that kills people with nut allergies. Like a sunflower. sunflower. I'm not. We'll I'm good. Something. We'll figure something out. But we're gonna present you sandwiches. The only thing is. You're going to be denying my sandwich at least three, three times. times. Yeah. Got a lot of I um, <laughs> I'm not going to get hung, hung up on the fact that you talked about edging and a peanut butter jelly sandwich in a single <laughs> sentence, but <laughs> I am I am going to get hung up on the chips thing. What kind of chips are you throwing in this bad boy? Because I've never heard of anyone putting chips in a PB and J. Oh my god! Okay. Just, you're gonna blow it's gonna blow your mind the first time i did it i this was maybe gonna, eight this isn't gonna see it yeah. <laughs> i one, was eight years old <laughs> for one thing the answer is any type of chips but becky has the definitive chip to put in the middle of it it is a it is a salt and pepper kettle cooked potato chip and the reason why is because it's a little bit crunchier i feel like it holds its like integrity a little more and what you want to do is like layer it inside the sandwich so when you fold the bread your single piece of bread over you can kind of Squish it down and it does a nice crotch. <laughs> That's when you know it's really ready. And you want the chips to hold their integrity. So when you eat it, and I like the salt and pepper because I like salt and pepper the best. It's weird. Same. You, uh, think, you think it's oh. going to be weird with uh, with the dang jelly, but it's great. Something about it works. Sometimes I like. What were those things called? Like Cheetos? Like, like that's really good too. Oh, like okay. in our case, like Tings. Or Anything Rose. actually is great. Like. Maybe salt and vinegar not as great, but still pretty good. Any kind of chips you have laying around. I like to say popcorn or like barbecue Sometimes chips. Sometimes I put popcorn in there. Put a, put a barbecue in there. It's good. <laughs> it's going to be yeah. a problem because I'm going to make one of these for lunch tomorrow. They're and so good. It's the not reason... going to be a problem. You're going to hit me up and I'm going to be like, we set you right. And <laughs> the, the greatest thing is I don't really like potato chips on their I like potato chips on their own. I don't what? really like the salt and pepper potato chips on their own. I only really like it in the sandwich. 
Oh, so yeah. it's kind of a nice thing to like. So, salt and peppers are all right. Yeah, they're all right. You know, pick something, get something with some real flavor punch to it. Yeah, they're those are sandwich it's chips. It's just not my. Yeah, they're sandwich chips. Save them for the sandwich, dear. I uh, <laughs> I only did it because I remember watching cartoons and eating my sandwich with my potato chips and being like, I don't really like these potato chips on their own. And then in the cartoon, they were eating sandwiches. I don't remember which cartoon it was. They were like fuzzy animals and it was crunching. And I was like, oh man, I want my sandwich to crunch. And that was the only reason Maybe why it was put, meant to be a firm lettuce. It was, it could have been a lettuce in their sandwich. I didn't think so. I thought my sandwich should crunch. And this is how I'm Golly. Gonna very this is the first question. Yeah. And we're yeah. already off the rails and then 20 the minutes in. And <laughs> let's keep talking about sandwiches. And these are like the most, depressing answers they're not they're this is I exciting love. i take a pickle and some fake cheese stop it I, this is my joy the sandwich break okay it's a sandwich it's like the best part of the day when you are like you're working and then you're working and then you're kind of hungry and you're like i'm gonna take a break and you make yourself a delicious sandwich you're talking about a great part of my day that is a pretty great part it's of a day. perk we um <laughs> We've had so many people say Ruben. So we used to name the episode sandwich with so and so. But so oh, many yeah, people so many people said Rubens <laughs> that we had to change the thing because it started getting to the point where our uh producer Mike was naming the episodes and it they kind of sounded sexy. Like it was like hot, steamy <laughs> Rubens. And I'm like, Mike <laughs> I don't think people want to get turned on by sandwiches, but I don't know if that's the, the route we're looking to go here. Well, <laughs> some people, to some people, sandwiches are quite sexy. A Reuben I count is myself good. among them. A Reuben is I good. shan't be kink shamed. <laughs> we're enjoying sandwiches. Well, the Earl, the Earl of Sandwich over here. <laughs> um, I did. I. I did not know that you grew up together, so that kind of changes my next question. Um. Well, so, don't change the question. Ask it the wrong way, and we'll answer it. Uh, well, I think I think it's a better. So it was going to be how do you approach working as a duo? But if you grew mm. up together, your styles may be similar because you've been in the similar spaces for so long. Do you think that affects working together at all? Um, we definitely have similar touchstones. I think because we grew up together and we took out the same books from the library and. Um, I think that kind of informs like our shared love of things. Like in the case of Wonder Woman, it's definitely a shared love of mythology. Um, that helps, but also we have very different tastes in things. So I think in some cases that might be difficult for people to work together, but I think in this case, it really works because we're both bringing things to the table that the other person wouldn't think of, you know? Yeah. And for for all the differences, there is an awful lot of intersectionality. And what's more important is a shared respect for the thing that um, that the other enjoys that maybe I, I don't enjoy as much. And similarly, uh, Becky always <clears throat> respects the things that I enjoy um, while, it, while it might not be necessarily be her cup of tea. I think... Definitely having similar upbringings uh, in terms of being from the same area, having kind of similar uh, home experiences growing up, kind of similar social dynamics growing up. Um, those things all feed into a, a synergistic quality of, of us being able to communicate on a level that I'm not able to communicate with too many people. Um, so when we both finished high school, Becky went to New York to go to art school, and I went to Boston to to be a punk rocker. And, uh, and little did I know, she was in art school doing and, and enjoying a lot of the same things that I was. And it, so it wasn't long after high school that I reached out to her and I and I said, like, hey, I see you're like doing all these punk flyers and stuff. Would you would you be willing to do like a t-shirt for my band because in high school she had drawn like logos and stuff for bands that I had been in um so we've kind of stayed in touch through all the different seasons of our lives and it's been really incredible how parallel they've been they've led us to a lot of the the same kind of media and in similar social circles 
so for all the differences that exist, um, we're definitely like of the same kind of walk of life, I guess. I don't know if that's a cool term. Cut for from it. the same cloth. Cut from the same Maybe? cloth. I don't yeah. know. We have we have like a similar set of experiences. So it, that's it's really an asset when it comes to writing together when we can drop a reference that maybe another writing partner might not fully grip. I, I can count on Becky mm-hmm. to either understand it or to know like, man, we live together. If she doesn't know what water country is, which was a small water park in Southern New Hampshire, <laughs> like I can sing her the theme song and I can pull up probably old weird video footage of it on YouTube. So um, in that way, uh, we're lucky I think most successful writing teams are are built similarly where there is a lot of shared interest, but there's also some great divergences in terms of those interests that get expressed within the page. That was such a great idea. Like it's hard for me sometimes to interview people because I'm, um, I get affected so easily. Like I get so excited hearing these things and like taking them in. Like I don't know how to segue to the next question. <laughs> but as both of you are artists, how does that affect the way you write a script for comics? Do you ever put notes in for the artists that maybe a writer who doesn't understand the art side of the house would wouldn't? Sometimes um, I tend to hold back on like directional stuff because I know I don't enjoy getting it from writers, mm-hmm. although. Sometimes it helps me like envision a page if it's like, oh, these are three small panels up top and then like a big panel up at the bottom. It's like just easy if they have an idea already. But for the most part, um, we don't tend to do too much direction like that. Um, I think in the first draft, we have a real clear, <clears throat> usually because I'll be the one who jumps in on the first draft initially. Um, I kind of paint a, a really clear picture. And then when Becky is handling her draft of it, I'll notice a lot of that kind of directorial, uh, a lot of the angles of the shots have been removed or changed, or it'll just be reworded in a more ambiguous way. <laughs> <clears throat> and I think I've like learned from that in terms of, um, Becky has a stronger command of visual language than I do. I, yes, I am an artist, but Becky is a, is a great artist by anyone's account. And I'm a serviceable artist by a f- small number of people's account. <laughs> so, um, I think you're a great artist. So when it, when it comes to working with these, uh, these high caliber artists that we're lucky to have been working with, we find that giving them as much as we think that they absolutely need to be able to capture the vision is good. Anything beyond that will become constrictive and it will limit their movement as an artist. So we, we put a lot of the work that we would normally do into uh, dictating the angles and dictating, um, I don't know, the, the nature and framing of the shots Rather than that, we put it into describing the emotion of what we're trying to capture panel per panel. So in the panel description, it'll certainly describe, um, you know, what's going on within the, in the scene, but a lot of the description is going to be about the mood that we're trying to communicate and the emotionality of the characters that are being portrayed in that particular scene or sequence. Yeah. It's, we've been really lucky. We work with artists whose work we're, very familiar with and sometimes when you write a script you're not um lucky enough to know who the artist is before you write it which can be a little difficult because you're kind of writing blinds but in a sense with like you know working with travis and uh mike oming on midnighter and it's it's just been really lucky and and of course jim bartell on immortal wonder woman you get a sense of like um, how the artist paces a page. And so you end up like writing for them, you know, mm-hmm. like bring to their strengths and being able to kind of envision how they would tell the story. So that really helps a lot when you're dealing with pacing and like, you know, how to, how to, how to work a page. Sorry, this cat is really getting in my face right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Get so, <laughs> uh, Corey, yeah. my cat has moved over to her job of the hut um, throne. So, I feel you. <laughs> um, what are some key factors for you writing to kind of get inside of a character's head before writing them? I think it all starts initially with being a fan of the character. Uh, so. I, I love doing research on characters and reading everything that I can get my hands on for them. And in the case of something like with Midnighter, when we were offered that book, um, I was pretty familiar with Midnighter already. So it was fun for me to go back and reread everything and to imagine what I, what I would do, you know, like, Oh my God, like this is every fanboy's dream as a fan of the character. What, what would be the thing that I would like to contribute? The only problem with that is you want to make it, uh, you want to make it consistent with the voice and attitude that's, that's been going throughout it because that's what brought you to the dance anyway. That's what made you love the character. So trying to figure out, those elements of the character that were really working and hanging on to those and then trying to let go of everything else. You can't be, you can't be held into um, a certain way of doing things because it worked for somebody else because it will come off as like a cover tune. It'll sound like, Oh, that's Michael and Becky trying to do Steve Orlando. We can't do Steve Orlando. And I, that's like, that's kind of a shame. It, the world could use more Steve Orlando's, but we can't do it that way. We have to find the things that we thought Steve did well with the character and then um, Brian K. Vaughn did well with the character and the other writers that have written Midnighter have done well with the character and find a way to use that as a vehicle to tell the kind of stories that we want to tell and to insert, and insert the elements into the character that we'd like to you run a real risk of, of alienating certain fans who will say like, Oh, you aren't getting the voice of Diana, right. Or something like that. And in which case, um, you know, I, I do care about what people have to say about stuff like that almost too much, but if they don't care for the way that, uh, we write Diana, they're, they're in luck because there's 80 years of history of her work to pick from. And uh, our Wonder Woman isn't the only Wonder Woman that's available to them. So if they don't care for <laughs> our Wonder Woman, um, it's okay. There's, there's plenty of other voices contributing to this ongoing mythology. And we're just lucky enough to be able to, to try and add something to it and to try and highlight certain things about it. What about you? <laughs> what about you, Becky? What do you, what do you uh, how do you get into the head of the character? Very method. No, I'm just kidding. I don't really method make my comments. Um, I, for a lot of our books, we've been really lucky to be able to create characters for them. Like, uh, like original character. We have Siegfried and Wonder Woman, and we've got a cool villain in Midnighter named Trojan. Um, and these characters are, um, they help to kind of show a different side to your main character. And I think building, you know, having our own original characters in there, whether it's like a friend or a foe, they're going to be a good foil for your main character to kind of like see what, you know, how does this character react to this? Or um, just, it, you get to know your characters better by... Um, Sorry, this is how they interact with the people around. How they interact. Mm -hmm. Sorry, this cat is really just being a crap head right now. What is what um, is the cat's name? This cat's name is Lorenzo. We are kind of fostering them. They're my sister's cats, and they're very. This one is very needy right now because we're not paying attention to him, so he's <laughs> getting all up in there. But yeah, for for Gotham Academy, we actually made soundtracks for all the characters. We went through and like did little mixtapes for them like imagine like what how they would which was a great exercise i think in getting to know characters that um we didn't know at all because they were all original to us 
So as kind of like a team building exercise, it was a lot of fun to go they were, through. They were cool soundtracks too. It had the, there was Nickelback photograph. It was, uh, <laughs> two, it, it's that was it though, weeks. right? Yeah. There was a lot of, a lot of good slaps on there. Yeah. Just total slaps. <laughs> Might as well be walking on the sun. Smash mouth. Hey, now you're a rock star. Smash mouth. Amber, the color, Amber is the color, color of your energy. energy. 311s. 311s. <laughs> Rest in peace to my man, uh, Nick Hexum. Just like this, the Shrek yeah. One soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> just every character. It's it's only Hey Now You're a Rock Star. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, else, is it just called Rock Star? I don't know. I, I think so. It's Which, like one wait. of the great, It's one of the greatest, biggest hits of our lifetime, and none of us know the name of it. Hey, man, Smash oh. Mouths Rock. Hey, now you're a rock star. <laughs> Is that the name? It must I don't know. be. Hold on. Think, hey, I now you're all star. Oh, all star. Oh. All star. <laughs> oh my god. All star. You know, I'd say edit that out, but I wear my inequities on my sleeve. Baby. <laughs> I'm that sorry, is Danny. Ridiculous. We've all heard that song hundreds of times. Hundreds. More. It's not on the Gotham Gaff- Academy soundtrack. But... Hey, now you're a rock star. <laughs> Get it, out of I, here. No, I bought it. I believed it. I think <laughs> Did... this is the Mandela effect in full yeah. effect. Imagine we looked it up and it Reggie was. Reggie the full Mandela effect. Yeah, there, there it is. <laughs> There it is. She did it. I did it. I went She's there. been doing puns all day. It's really charming. <laughs> I feel like Jamie it's McKelvey forced says. into living with Kieran Gillen. <laughs> um, oh, man. The, the soundtrack thing is awesome. I'm a huge fan of when writers do that, especially when they put them out so people can listen to them. Yeah, um, I think yeah, but it was so long ago that they're probably yeah. just lost to the internet yeah. of time. Yeah, DC um, does it every so often with new books. I've been listening yeah. to the the Milk Wars one um, the past couple of oh, weeks. Yeah, I'm sure um, that's awesome. If if it was um, if it was Gerard and Jeremy and them putting it together, it's probably got some real real jammies on yeah. there it's got nickelback it's got smash <laughs> mouth it's got yeah. rock star you know you're Pino, a rock star you know rock star <clears throat> yeah so Ugh. we are recording one week out from wonder woman number one and this first question normally i like start off with like talking to the writers about the character what they believe things like that um but this one comes directly from um ethan who runs our social media and this is exactly how he sent it to me and I've got a couple follow-ups to this one, but why Siggy hot? Why why Siggy hot? Why Siggy hot? <laughs> why why Travis Moore? Yeah, blame like, Travis. Travis Moore. We said in the script, <clears throat> like we described him as impossibly good looking, like the type of person that doesn't matter who you are, like his beauty is transcendent. And we did we did specify that <clears throat> in our in our story he is of Persian descent um, because there's some there's some stuff in the in the history of if of, you're looking back at history the Vikings did like a shitload of trading they had trade routes everywhere so it would make sense that you know you meet people um, a lot mm-hmm. of there's it historical Kara Brunhilde. Um, her brother was a dude named Atlee, who th- people think was Attila the Hun. So there's all this like crazy historical significance mixed in with the, the mythology. And frankly, we wanted to qualify that our Valhalla, our, our Asgard isn't whitewashed. It isn't, um, it isn't a bunch of Aryan brutes running around celebrating themselves because we find that type of thing abhorrent. Abhorrent? Abhorrent. Uh, abhorrent? Oh, God. I, I can write, but I can't speak. Abhorrent, um, is, abhorrent is a little different of a book. <laughs> a porn, a porn site? <laughs> we're, we're talking about Siggy. So. Yeah. So with, with Siggy, we wanted him dashing and charming and cool and... Yeah, man, Travis really like he stuck his butterfly net out and caught a caught a comet, and away we go. Like everyone's in love with Siggy. I love it, and I love that 
Siggy is like sticking that people are like using that term because I remember when we were writing it, I was like, man, we keep misspelling Siegfried. There's the I's and the E's and I just get so confused. (laughs) It's a hard word. And also, Very, like, it's so hard. I failed spelling multiple times. So we wanted nice Wonder case. Woman to be fun, like she's enjoying herself. Yeah, bit, she's had a so. hard time. You know, so, a difficult time for Wonder Woman. So we we used this as a way to like kind of get her in a place to just have a little fun for a bit. I mean, she's she's gonna have to, you know, she things get a little difficult for her, but you know, at least for a minute. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I want to say good to that. Like, I don't know if I want her to go through hard stuff, but... No, well, I mean, you know what I mean. Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's a I, comic. I you, gotta, it's... you gotta do some punching. Death Metal hard. Death Metal is it's so difficult gotta do her. some punch. Yeah. And we already kind of showed that we can write depressing stuff. You know, we wrote Immortal Wonder Woman, which, you know, the people that loved it, loved it as a meditation of the meaning of Wonder Woman and indeed the meaning of existence and choices that we make etc uh, and, and the people that ooh, didn't ooh, like dark it side. <laughs> yeah. and then the people that didn't like it were like man this is like depressing and boring and meditative and that's not what i'm reading comics for so yeah uh, people who didn't like it were like i don't like poetry we immortal wonder woman wasn't out <laughs> at the time that we had started writing this particular um chapter of wonder woman's story so it's not a response to that, but I think for us, we we felt like we made kind of a statement with a mortal Wonder Woman that, and we didn't want to tread the same ground of her being like, "Oh, I'm dead," and what what meaning has life anyway? Uh, every everyone I know is dead, yeah. <laughs> flying around in space, being the only thing left alive. Yeah, that was our pitch for a mortal Wonder Woman, and they they liked it. So yeah, they was- said we want to do like Wonder Woman way in the future. And we said, can we do it? And they said, yes, you can. And then when we came back with our idea, they were like, wow, you really did put her way in the future. You took it very <laughs> literally. <laughs> literally. I, really did it. I think my favorite, um, probably not for you two, it wasn't your favorite reaction, but the person who like lost their mind over the idea that Wonder Woman and Superman would kiss, that was a... Oh, there, there's a lot of people who were... Yeah. Uh, who were very there. I didn't realize there was like that kind of investment in that. Um, for, for me that like the, the moments with Diana and Superman and an immortal wonder woman, it was, it was kind of like, there goes somebody that I love platonically. There goes Mm -hmm. somebody that I've cared about incredibly. Um, yeah, these two have been fighting side by side and like staying, you know they've had their differences in the past and I'm sure they've been in relationships at some point but we wrote it from the standpoint that this is these are two people who care about each other very much in the same way that she cares about bruce you know like her yeah. and batman also there's and- also people that are wild about that relationship there's people that are wild about wonder woman and steve trevor and there's people that are wild about every different uh, partner that she's ever taken and even partners that she's hasn't hasn't taken there's people who desire that very much and honestly like <clears throat> for me it's i'm into it i'm into people having their p- particular fandoms in their in their little corners of things i just wish that they would be be a little kinder to each other <clears throat> and also maybe Maybe it's kind of weird that this, the most important and dynamic female character, arguably in comics, is going to be limited and marginalized down to who she's dating at any given time. Like, to me, that's kind of strange because I I don't know that that happens as frequently for male characters. I'm sure that it does. I'm sure there's like um, fan groups for every type of coupling that happens in comics but uh i i wish that people would would maybe loosen up a little bit with regard to that kind of thing because we were kind of nervous with introducing siegfried to to wonder woman's world and having them exchange this like drunken kiss um i i was sweating when that when that (laughs) came out because we were like oh man people were 
we're so sprung on the whole Wonder Woman Superman thing. I was hoping people would get into Wonder Woman Spectre, actually. Yeah, I think there's <laughs> definitely some sexual tension between. I wrote that scene. I was like, whoo, whoo. I came out of the room like, Michael, it's hot in here. We got to turn, turn the heat down. She wrote that scene. She said, well, we co wrote the wrote scene. It. Come on. <laughs> You know, I could, yeah, I could kind of see it. I, I more so kept staring at the Green Lantern ring, and I was like, uh, "Hal Jordan was the best Specter." But <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. d- d- well, I don't want to confirm or deny any rumors. Yeah, but <laughs> <clears throat> I came right to you. I was like, "Hey, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not confirming or denying any rumors, but <laughs> but good um, eye, good eye." So. I, I want to ask you, what makes Wonder Woman special to you? Like, she's part of the DC's Trinity. What what do you think makes her stand so far apart from people like Batman and Superman? Do you want to go first? I feel like I... You go. I like it when you go first. Okay, I'm going to try and keep it brief because I talk so, so damn much. I think Wonder Woman as, as a character is different from Wonder Woman as the icon. Wonder Woman as the icon is um, she has elevated above and beyond comics, film, cartoons, everything. Uh, Someone need not engage with any media at all. And you kind of know what Wonder Woman is. It's almost like, have you ever heard that theory about the hundred monkeys? Have either of you? I feel like we've told me about this before. There's, this isn't true, but it's said that if you take a hundred <laughs> monkeys and you teach them a new way to crack open a coconut on an island, that on the mainland, that there the monkeys there will suddenly start showing that behavior as well. They too will be cracking the coconut in this new, more effective way. And that that's not true that's that's something that's just like an idea or a thought experiment that's been out there but i i feel like that's kind of like the best way to describe how people feel about wonder woman it's it's so iconic that you just kind of know oh she is the the most powerful she's super like hopeful and truthful and and powerful and you recognize the iconic logo and the costume even when it changes you just know what it is it's like built into our genetic fiber at this point so for me that's what's really exciting about working on wonder woman is to have the opportunity to take the, this character that is identifiable by i reckon a huge portion of theorists of the earth's population and everyone has kind of an image of what that means to them. So to wield that kind of power, to be able to contribute a little bit to that myth is huge. What I love about her is that she is entirely flexible as a character because in her 80 year history, she has been everything from comedic to dire, to Royal, to silly, to being a spy, to being, the most powerful to being the most vulnerable. So for me, that makes it a really exciting character to write because the door is really open to all kinds of exploration as to what what she's going to do next. It might disappoint people, but there's always something in that 80-year history that you can point to and say, look, there's there's been proof that this this is something that she does. So... To me, that's uh, my favorite thing about Diana. I agree. See, I knew you were going to play me like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think Diana, um, but one of the things that's interesting about her is to a lot of people, if you just pick a random person on the street, if they don't know anything about comic books, they'll be able to tell you about Clark Kent. They'll be able to tell you about Superman, like where he came from, um, that he grew up you know, in Smallville on a farm that he works as a reporter, you know, they know about that people know his history, his, you know, how his parents died and um, all of that stuff. But a lot of people, if you say like, what's Wonder Woman's origin story, a lot of people don't know. And mm-hmm. even that right now is, you know, I would say that the canon of that is hotly contested. I like the. Well, after, after the events of death metal, 
I think the door is open to all potentialities. Yeah, it's just interesting because I feel like then when you look at that, the definitive Wonder Woman story, there's been so many great runs, but it's almost as if we haven't had that, the story that like solidifies her as not like more than an icon, but like a character. Who is she? Like people need to know. Mm, (laughs) And that's an exciting thing. It means that there's still like potential. I think with Batman, you know, you're always going to have potential to tell great stories, but it's a lot more daunting because um, there's been so many like iconic runs on that. You know, you're never going to make, I'm never going to do Dark Knight. You know, I'll never be Mm -hmm. able to make a long Halloween. Like these books have already been done and they're definitive. And I think with Wonder Woman, there's been so many incredible books on the run, but there's still room for more, you know? That's not to say there's not room for more. I keep going backwards. Like I'll walk forwards yeah. and walk my answer backwards, but you know what I'm trying to well, say. You, I think the fear is nothing that we say should be taken as like well, the truth. That's you know? true. Like, That's true. We are writers. So we're, we're writers. not going to lie. We're meant to lie. <laughs> we are meant as we want to do. Before some weirdo writes in and they're like, what about that George Perez thing? Or what about Greg Rucka over here? Or no, that's what over there? it's. We value those stories entirely. Becky is saying that she believes that there's still room to contribute to that. And yeah. To have a voice there. And, and I, I, think I think with Batman, there is still room for like a great Batman stories for and, sure. And great Superman stories. But um, it's I, like, there, there's so much, you know what I mean? Like there's just like, I feel like there's so much potential with Wonder Woman, which is exciting and terrifying at the exact same time. Yeah, I, I, I see what you're I'm hearing what you're saying is someone who has not read a ton of Wonder Woman uh, only because there hasn't been things for people to suggest to me, like there's no Wonder Woman hush. There's no long Halloween. There's no like, yeah, there's that's nothing that you great, can one word. it. Yeah. yeah, that's a great way to put it is. We would like, if we do our job well, we would like to be one of those books where it's easy to point to and, and be say, like, hey, Wonder Woman a, Afterworlds. Yeah, you're a new Wonder Woman reader. Here's a great place to jump on. It's mm-hmm. a really exciting story. You're going to learn about her as she learns about herself and let's rock and roll. I, that's, that's by design. You know, it's we wanted to create a, a place for new readers because frankly, we we knew that there would be some interest in what we were doing and we wanted to make sure that if there's a little interest that we aren't jumping people into the deep end of the pool of being like, Hey, you got to understand there's 30 other characters here that you never heard of before. Like, Oh, you have to read all of death metal to understand Mm -hmm. what's happening in our book, which it's, I think if you read death metal and if you have been keeping up with wonder woman in the past and are a big fan, there's going to be a lot there for you. But this is also a great spot to just get involved and learn about the character. And, and hopefully we're telling a story that's really going to resonate with anybody. As someone, as I said, didn't read too much. I think it's a really, really good jumping on point for anyone because Diana knows as much about herself as we do, it seems. So <laughs> it is. I wrote about it a couple times this week for different projects and sites, but it is probably the best jumping on point for a major character like this in a very long time, in my opinion. Wow. Um, so I'm going to have if that you... chiseled into my grave. <laughs> I don't know that I'll be buried, but I'll still buy a grave next yeah, week. <laughs> yeah, a little small have a, yeah. a plaque. Yeah, we can have a plaque on a brick on a walkway in a park. Yeah, I like that. that there you says, go, perfect. That says Michael cre- co-created a <laughs> <laughs> a great jump on point for a major character one time back in 2021. 20, <laughs> um, then major. it'll just have your name really big at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I got lost my I lost, lost my place in this document. Um, <laughs> so Diana has a unique relationship with the world as is. Like she isn't she wasn't raised in the world as we know it. She was from Themyscira. What do you think, how do you think that changed her character? Or the, how that, um, how did it contribute to shaping her? Uh, I think, think, thank you for interviewing. (laughs) I think Becky and I are 
like being from a small town that felt super removed and we felt oftentimes like we were meant to be somewhere else. Um, I can only imagine that might be how, how Diana feels sometimes. I like, I, I think she's super at home with the Amazons, but I think she almost felt more like when you go off to college or something and you start to really discover who you are when you're, when you're off away from kind of the social mores and taboos of your, of your weird little hometown and your, and your family and their expectations. Um, so I, I think that, I think that's a huge contributing factor that, Aren't, that isn't present for someone like S- Superman was raised like in, in a small town, but he is like about it. He loves being, uh, being an American, <laughs> you know, he <laughs> loves being American and Bruce, you know, Batman, he's lived in Gotham his whole life. And like, he's, he'll, he'll probably die there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wonder Woman's, uh, I think she's like maybe got like an, an adventurer's heart, an yeah. explorer's she's heart. She's got a bit of wanderlust. I think I think to be take on the mantle of Wonder Woman and to, you know, be having to go out into the world of men, as it were. Um, she definitely has like core values instilled in her from, you know, her mother and from growing up. But at the same time, I think there's that, you know, what Michael said, finding yourself. Um, finding out what she's meant to do, like how to help people, like what her calling is, is out. It's bigger than like where she's from, you know? Yeah. And I think she's got the same kind of feeling going back to the Island that we do now. Becky and I are both, you know, grown people. So now when we go back to our hometown to visit family, uh, we enjoy it, you know, and it's kind of, strange to be back in this place that we fought and scraped and got out of as quickly as we could. And now we go back and we enjoy it. I think, I think there's an element of that to Diana. I think when she finds herself back on the Island at times, um, it, it is home. And, but it's a different, it's probably a different home that she's been gone for so long too. You know, she's, um, She's had a long life. You come back from college. Yeah, and you things know have everything. changed a little bit. <laughs> You're telling your parents their food sucks and that they got to try Thai food or whatever. <laughs> parents You're so much more never, worldly. <laughs> <laughs> You've never had Thai food. You don't know what a falafel is. <laughs> you, don't, yeah, you don't know what a falafel is? <laughs> Sounds awful. Oh, we're going to this place called Chipotle. Yeah, my dad took me to Chipotle. <laughs> He's like, we're gonna go to Chipotle. I hear they've got tons of vegan offerings. <laughs> love that. Love that man. Love vegan that options. man. <laughs> vegan options. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. That's, I think that kind of answered the question. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a great answer, and you you got the Superman part in, which was a uh, one of like the guiding questions. So perfect. Um, <clears throat> so with death metal. It ended with kind of everything mattering, or everything matters, whatever you want to say. Um, as storytellers, is story more important than trying to fit in as much continuity as possible to you? Yes. Yes, definitely. Absolutely. We talk about this all the time. Yeah. You, you, you do this one. <laughs> this is like one of our, our things that we love to, love to bring up. Uh, continuity is semi-important i think you have to know going in like going into this book we knew where diana was coming from um we knew she had ascended so it was kind of a it made sense to like put her into the sphere of the gods you know have her (laughs) hang out um but honestly continuity is so much like if uh geez i just lost my train of thought i'm doing bad tonight (laughs) i'm doing bad (laughs) the basis of continuity is if something is cool, like that is the only thing that makes something last within continuity. If something sucks, it gets written out, forgotten. And the only time it gets brought up is when somebody's talking about like the, the dumbest stories. It's like when Spider-Man was a clone. Like no one talks about that because (laughs) they, the 
but struck it from the record. Yeah, it's a, because it, it just didn't work. It's a black guy. <laughs> I thought it was kind of cool, but I know. think I think it worked really well. I think like <laughs> I actually was just reading about this. It did really really well. But, but at the time, and then, I like, guess the publicists or whatever were like, we got to make more, like marketing demanded like we got to drag this out. So it went from being a three month thing into being a, being bloated and problematic. But then you look at something like X-Men Days of Future Past, you look at Dark Knight, you look at Batman Year One, you look at Watchmen, you look at all these things that are, you know, not necessarily canon to the DCU. You look at uh, Darwin Cook's The New Frontier. Uh, there's so many things that are just so cool that in my head and in the heads and hearts of most readers, you're like, yeah, at some point in the future, uh, Batman's like kind of older and it does this and that. And, and all of a sudden dark Knight becomes part of your head canon. And it's probably part of the head canon of the people that are working on those characters at that time too. So it slowly moves its way over this thing that wasn't meant to be part of main continuity suddenly starts sliding over. And that's, that's determined by critical response. It's determined by readers. It's determined by other creators latching, latching on, you know, hitching their wagon to, to whatever star is shooting across the sky. Um, so that's the goal. Like we, we need to know about continuity because we need to kind of cut people off at the pass and be who want to show up and be like, Oh, so-and-so would never do this because they were over here. You know, Cool. We, yeah, like, we have to deal with that a little bit in house with like, you know, if you with how the sausage mm -hmm. is made, we have to, you know, if we want a character, we have to make sure we like reserve them almost, you know, just to make sure they're not like over yeah. on earth who doing whatever they're doing or like, you know, <laughs> um, you want to make sure that when you, when you get to that point of like using that character, it's like, oh, but they're actually like, they're in Arkham Asylum right now. You can't use them. Yeah. Can so, I ask how that works? Like, how did, like, do you tell someone at DC, like, or your editor, be like, hey, we want to use so and so yes. here? Yeah, that's and exactly what happens. And it's, you know, we're right now, we're like four months or five months out. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we write like further ahead. You know, you have to because the art takes a long time and then there's coloring and then there's lettering and it all has to get put together. And then there's so many rounds of revisions and edits. Um, and, you know, so working that far out, you have to plan your next year of stories. And to do that, you have to know like, well, what's, who are the characters we're going to use? And, and we might not have like everything written out, like super detailed, but we do have an idea of like, you know, the themes that we want to tell and, and where the story is going to go and what characters we want to bring in. Um, and so telling our editors being like, we need, to, we're going to use this character here. They're going to make sure that at that point, if the character is going to show up anywhere else, like if they have their own book planned or if there's like, Oh, there's an arc going on over here in like the Superman world, you know, just to make they sure gotta, that everything kind of works. Yeah. They got to make sense of it. Yeah. And that's like, that's the value mm -hmm. of continuity is making sense of things where it starts to lose its value is like I said, in the future, in the future, yeah, people will read these books and if if it's cool it it counts and it lasts and that's what i love 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 about what's happened as a result of death metal yeah and, and what's happening as we move forward into infinite frontier is we're we're taking away some of these weird strictures that we've been living by for no reason and being like you know what if something is cool and something is turning you on, you know, maybe, maybe you can bring it to your story and maybe, maybe you can do something creative. Yeah. Maybe, you know, like this is comic books, like maybe go and just tell the best damn story you can and maybe people will show up and, and read it. Yeah. I think events are a lot of fun. Um, they're fun to be involved with. They're crazy because there's so many teams and people involved. It's like Future State, um, you know, the, the big crossover events with, you know, all these different characters and storylines. Um, but the difficult thing is after, you know, a few years, like the shelf life of those books, you need to make sure that your book is going to be like have a timeless quality where people are going to be able to mm -hmm. pick it up and understand what's happening. And if, um, 
if Batman is a robot at a certain point, which is cool, but like, you know, this was in, for example, when we did Gotham Academy, there was a time in the main Batman book where Batman was a robot and it was Gordon in the bat suit, bat robot. Oh, yeah. And then in our book, we wanted Batman to show up and they're like, well, he's a robot. And I was like, but kids reading our book on the shelf, they're probably not going to be reading Batman because it was, you know, Gotham Academy was a YA book. So in the future, it didn't make sense to like have this all of a sudden Batman's a robot for like a day, you know, like it didn't, <laughs> like if you're reading that book independently of the books that it came out alongside, you want to make sure that you're in continuity, but at the same time, mm-hmm. you want to make sure that it stands on its own outside of continuity. Yeah, it's there, there's there's some books where it makes a lot of sense to have continuity be uh, kind of the bones that everything is, is built off of. And then in other books, it's, far less important and i think sometimes uh people put a little too much importance in it maybe and maybe just uh relax. maybe lighten up a little bit <laughs> relax <laughs> have, have fun like remember it's comics remember you're like, yeah it's only a comic yeah it's only comics yeah. and even though like i live and breathe and die by comics like i can tell you it's it's only comics like it's it's all right yeah, like have fun. fun yeah, yeah. Like, that's what we're like, doing we're trying to escape. find a new hobby like, <laughs> trying to forget paint. my trying pain. To have a new hobby where you can have fun again i'm trying to forget yeah. my pain <laughs> 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 yes dear take away my pain yes dear <laughs> so i did want to talk about midnighter a little bit as well what do you think makes midnighter such an interesting character to write for it, you know in the case of us writing Midnighter, I think part of the interest is that he is so incredibly different from Diana. He's got a whole different moral compass. Uh, he's got a whole different language and lifestyle. And uh, there's something. Yeah, moral code. <laughs> or yeah, it's a moral compass. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, if you want to change my words around, that oh. would be in keeping with our collaboration as co writers. <laughs> um i think there's something that ties um uh, that ties midnighter to a very like modern era of comics um whereas uh diana there's something about her that and it's you know it's probably because we've seen her existing in a number of different ages um where she's not as tethered to this like modernity so when we when we started writing um, Midnighter, one of the things that we loved about him is that he's his violence is so over the top that it almost crosses over and becomes almost comedic. Uh, because if you don't look at it as as such, you're just reading a comic book about somebody who kills people all the time, and that that yeah. I've got kind of a problem with. So. The way that we wanted to write him is, at least initially, is let's just make it a romp. Let's make it big and dumb and violent and over the top and have, not have the huge weight and, and consequence that certain other stories do. Um, mm-hmm. And then that kind of evolved into something far different that I wasn't expecting, which is a story that is so complex and twisted that when when I presented certain ideas to Becky and she was like, all right, I'm going to go make sense of this. And I returned to her and she was like, here's what I got. Uh, she had drawn a number of diagrams and pie graphs and <laughs> charts. And I became so overwhelmed by it that I had to go like lay down on the couch with like a towel over my eyes. You became while. physically ill. I was physically <laughs> ill. Um, I gave him a headache. <laughs> because what we're doing is a time travel story and you know we we were just talking about continuity i think it is important for to obey your own rules within a story it's mm-hmm. called ver- verisimilitude or verisimilitude which is like good good word yeah i, I learned it from youtube uh <laughs> it's uh it's like within the context of a story as long as you're obeying the own your own rules then you're good and that's true for like time travel stories and it's 
true for stories about people with magical powers and things like that. So Becky really did the heavy lifting to make sure that in this particular story, we had established our own rules and that we were sticking with it. And sometimes you don't even have to tell the audience the rules, but as long as you know them and you can follow them, the audience will be able to make sense of it. Like, oh, this is a universe that makes sense. And um, sometimes you can, you know, your readers aren't stupid. They'll be able to figure it out mm-hmm. if you like lead a breadcrumb trail. So it's not about like, you know, t- telling the rules out, out front. You know, you don't want to be, you know, you want to have some cards, keep them secret and close to your vest, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this, this one is not written down, so it's going to be a little off the cuff, but I think where I really met Midnighter was the Grayson and Orlando stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, and, he has a kind of element of oh we've already gotten to the um we've already mentioned edging so he's kind of like he's got a flirty horny energy to him <laughs> it's so horny <laughs> yeah well will your midnighter have any of that uh, horny energy he's our midnighter i think is a little angsty maybe yeah which is just okay. pent up horniness when you think about it <clears throat> i think so far <laughs> so far in what what you've seen uh it's him dealing with stuff that doesn't really allow him to, to, to feel comfortable enough to be able to be in a situation where that element of his character comes out. But I guarantee you as things continue, um, yeah, you're going to see, that's one of the things that I love about Midnighter as well. And it's, it will be part of stuff that's forthcoming. Um, Good. We just, we didn't want to take away from, establishing mm-hmm. uh the story that we we're trying to tell by having him you know pinch somebody's ass or something like that yeah or you know, <clears throat> in my in my understanding of midnighter he's like less likely to be the guy that's gonna pinch your ass and y- like we are the ones who will pinch his ass but you know, he'll <laughs> he will have made that happen yeah he will have <laughs> somehow enticed us by his sheer charm so yeah just the I think one of my favorite lines in all of comics is when he sees Dick Grayson. He goes, "Oh, I know that ass anywhere." Yeah, <laughs> and so good, so good. It's such a, it's such a well written. Like that's why I like this character so much. So getting something of more time travel fun is very exciting. Yeah, yeah. We and, um, we were dealing with the, oh, I can't even say it. The War Worlds Midnighter. So it's like on World Worlds. He on War Worlds. He's Worlds of War. Worlds of War. Superman Worlds of War. Yes, it's just it's a gnarly place. You know, there's not much time for getting sexy on World War Worlds. On War World. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of hard to say. It's very <laughs> for right. me. It's very difficult. I don't but, say World, 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 World. Yeah. No. Our yeah, our story is kind of bombastic, and then he finds himself in quite a pickle by the end of it. Um, which leads us to our backups in action comics that uh, Mike Oming is drawing the hell out of. Right yeah, now. it's it's going to be really exciting. I think we're gonna we're gonna throw people for a loop with with what shows up in the in the back pages of action, especially because like action comics is you know iconic. It's the first like superhero comic available broadly. And to be able to bring a queer character into the pages of that comic the, yeah, book. Yeah, the first superhero <clears throat> comic. It's, um, for us, it's meaningful. It's a huge responsibility. Um, but along with that responsibility comes the comes certain parameters that we have to operate within. Mm-hmm. The action comics is made uh, so that it can be purchased broadly. It can be the first yeah. comic that you bring home for little Jimmy. Um, so we've already like run into our, our first real encounters with getting a a script sent back and, and being asked to tone down certain elements. Um, none of the, none of the things that we've been asked to tone down though, have been relative to, uh, Midnighter's sexual preference. Did we have never gotten any pushback, blowback? Most of it's questioning. just like violence. It's, yeah, violence. it's all violent violence. stuff. It's like, can we maybe just tone that down? But I just want to make that super clear that I think DC has got a real, real interest in in doing what they can to try and make up for errors that the comic industry has been making 
for years and years and years. And I'm, I'm very excited by uh, some of the things that I'm seeing DC do right now. So I'm, I'm hopeful for a, for a better, more representative, uh, more inclusive future of comics. And for us, like I say, it means a lot to be able to bring this identifiably LGBT character into the pages of action comics. Super, super big privilege there. That's all. Like, that's incredible. I'm, I didn't even real. I didn't even think of that. Like I, I was so excited for Midnighter, but I didn't realize that it was an action. It's like, wow, that's, that's a good move. Um, mm. Especially because they are doing that other stuff as well. I think it's something um, that needed to be done because that's how the world is. Yeah, um, agree. But, and so his power is pretty, uh, would you call it a power? Or would you call it an ability for him to be able to do what he does? Midnighter? He has both powers and he, abilities. Yeah, he's, he's got like a healing factor. He's got yeah. like... Which is a power because he's got, I feel like it's latent. <clears throat> yeah, he's got like technology that can like teleport him. He's got a supercomputer in his brain that can make him think better <laughs> <laughs> makes him smarter you want to you want to feel like an idiot try writing about a character that's supposed <laughs> yeah. to be smarter than you oh are. my god yeah there's we we have like an evil genius villain and of course it's like oh no <laughs> how do i be smart <laughs> um yeah i think i think midnighter is a combination of those things i think it's kind of like it's kind of uh they were, they were, I don't know if I'm like even supposed to say this. Everyone knows that Midnighter is like initially an analog of Batman, right? And I think they, that the folks that created Midnighter needed a way to kind of shortcut their way to, to getting to like Batman level. And you can't be like, oh, he went and like trained in the mountains of Nepal under this assassin and then did the... No, he's got a supercomputer in his brain. He's got a healing factor. Let's go. Like, let's just get <laughs> yeah. into it. It's, it's what if Superman and Batman are, are dating or married? Like, how does that look? How does that feel? What if that Batman was also somebody who didn't have an issue with taking life? Um, it's definitely evolved well beyond that. But I think that's kind of the uh, the seed that, that was that created this character whose powers and skills and technology stuff at all, all kind of blends together. I don't think any one of those things are super necessary for Midnighter anymore because now we all know who Midnighter is and you could strip him of his powers and just make him punch people in the face. And it would still be awesome because he's, his personality is what really shines in that book. Yeah. He's a, Oh, he's a great leather daddy. Yeah, That's, exactly. You're like, here. It's, it's what we needed. And damn it, we've got it. <laughs> and we, des- we also deserved it. We deserved <laughs> it. We deserve it and we needed it's it. The and year we that we deserved. It, and yeah. here it is. We're doing it. So we had a listener ask um, Becky specifically, are there any plans for something similar to By Chance or Providence? Yes. Yes, there is. And I'm working on it slowly. So slowly. Not right slowly. So slowly. Um, I've got, I did a follow up to by chance of Providence called the King's story a few years ago, two years ago by now. So long time. It's goes so fast and so slow at the same time. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a follow up to wolves. And then I've got another follow up to that story coming, but it's getting out of hand. It's like a hundred pages now and it's not even close to being done. So we'll see. It just that's takes a, a while because it's like in the, in the meantime. You know, in the spare time mm-hmm. is when I work. She on says it. she's going slow, but you're on page fifty-five. Page fifty-five of pencils. It's brilliant! Wow, it's long. It's long. Do you do that one digital or this physical? one? I'm doing physically. I like uh, for whatever reason. I I mean, I like drawing digitally. Drawing comics digitally is more difficult than cover work. I find like illustration. Mm-hmm. I like because you zoom in a little bit, you can get kind of noodly but I lose track of scale very easily. And for a comic page, I think it, you know, it's that aspect can lead to inconsistencies in like line work. So I like having everything like there. And plus it's nice to see like a big stack of paper being like, yeah, that's my 
that's my book. Yeah, I was recently I was looking at the covers of Shade and I was like, oh, I wonder if these are physical or digital. And honestly, it's probably for the best that they were digital because otherwise I would have found a way to purchase them. <laughs> yeah, some <laughs> um, of that stuff is like I could only do it because it was digital. The colors were so wild. Mm -hmm. Um, when I was inking it, I would ink on like four or five different layers to be able to change like different color holds on the line work. Um, so it was, you know, sometimes if I'm working digitally, it's because the, the illustration will call for it. Um, oftentimes I like to do traditional, um, just because it's fun, but, mm -hmm. you know, being digital allows me to like move around a bit, you know, if I'm traveling more, um, yeah, I traveled a lot before I ended up in Texas. So it was, you know, I was doing a lot of digital work for a bit. And I, I know we've talked a lot about your IP work, but you both have Mystery School Comics. I have a bunch of the pins on my board in front of me. Yay! And I've been using a, a guitar pick as my bookmark. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, I love that. Uh, we'll send you, you some tell more. Her. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I saw you put more stuff up and I was about to order it um, <laughs> earlier. Shoot, a, shoot us a message after this. Yeah, we, um, <clears throat> we've got Mystery School Comics Group kind of as like a place where not only where we can like put our weird own thing that, you know, that maybe isn't something to be brought to an independent publisher. You know, just the stuff that a lot of what I've done through mystery school has been stuff that I wouldn't have created otherwise, you know, it wouldn't be something that I would try and pitch to a publisher. It wouldn't be something that I would try and build out to a bigger idea or reskin to make a, make be a Superman story or something like that. It's been um, a place of complete freedom, a place of just raw expression, a place where I can, green light whatever i wish to do and just kind of go with it and do it um there is some consideration for sales because you know i don't want to spend a bunch of money to make pins that you know i'm gonna be looking at a box of <clears throat> of these pins that no one else wants so i i i there is like a commercial aspect to it i guess but the main thing is it's just a place where I can feel free and hopefully where Becky can feel free. I and, feel very free. <clears throat> and it's kind of the fail safe. Um, it was this time last year that like COVID was first happening and I was feeling very excited about my comic book future. I've, I had just put out a, a comic book called Tremor Dose through Comixology Originals. I was really excited about that. Uh, around that same time, man, was it just a year or so ago that it this was, was about a year ago? Um, Doom Patrol had come we out. We were supposed to go to Emerald City, and that got canceled last minute. Yeah, so. it was. There was a lot of great successes happening for me, and it looked like even more success was going to happen. And then COVID happened, and the entire comics industry kind of like pulled the handbrake, and I was very scared. So I just made, I made two comics really quick, two, too many comics. <clears throat> and then, you know, made a couple of other things. And then miraculously, I got a job writing a video game. And then that kind of led to more work with DC. But during that time, I realized like, oh, it's mystery school is always there. Mystery school doesn't go away. Uh, the mystery school is is always there as the you know if things if things aren't appropriate for a publisher it's there if publishers aren't interested in emailing me back i am my own publisher i can do whatever <laughs> i wish whenever i want and i think that becky uh relates to it in a similar way so yeah we um you know because every year there's the big tons of conventions we do like almost a con every month i would say when like the season starts um like from like march april may so but last year of course that you know everything kind of was on pause and this year too but we had a bunch of stuff that was made um like pins and comics and all this stuff and it was like well we've got 
like we're just sitting on all this stuff and and normally it would be stuff that we would sell anyway online but the bulk of it was supposed to go to conventions so it was kind of like it was really good that we had this you know system already built up and in place where we could um like put all this stuff online it's, um, it's kind of in line with our diy ethics too we used to work with a company that would handle fulfillment of shipping stuff and sometimes we miss that because it's a lot of work to fill orders and inevitably you're gonna, you're gonna blow it on something <laughs> I'm so bad at emails and now there's even more emails to <clears throat> yeah. do um oh. but we love being able to actually have a relationship with the people that care about us and the things that we make and uh it's really there have been beautiful friendships born of what we do um, that wouldn't exist otherwise. And again, like it goes back to, we're seeing a lot of uh, great creators moving toward, it's almost like they've just discovered that they can do things themselves. And that's like the first thing that we discovered is, oh, I can make a zine. I can can make a comic book on my own. By chance of Providence was originally three mini comics that I did. And I only brought it to Image just because, you know, they were laying around and Lee Lurich was, you know, did a great job on the colors for it. But the next book that I do, I'll probably bring it to Image also, but it's going to be mini comics first because that's just where my heart is. You know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's the most fun that I have working on comics is the stuff that, I do for myself and not, not to say that working on wonder woman isn't fun, but (laughs) there's a different quality to it. Like, I feel like you can get lost in your head a little bit more. Like I'll have dreams about my characters. I'll think about them in my off time, you know, and it's like, Oh, even if it's not stuff that I'll end up working on, there's like an element of like absolute freedom and just, it's just like the, yeah, I, yeah, like it's like a, a feeling that I got when I was a kid working on my own comics is the same feeling that I get now. I imagine that yeah. it's similar to you working for these really well-known um, like comic review sites and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And the the feelings that you have and the, and the pride that you take in that work as compared to something like this where you're a much bigger constituent piece of it. Um yeah like yeah, there's it's yours. Little, yeah, yeah it's passion it's, it's that passion. Passion. yeah i yeah. could never do a gc52 at a cbr or a big site nobody right. wants to read this weird meta coverage <laughs> of comics uh, i oh, love oh, contrary, it. everyone does yeah and i think it's taking um <clears throat> it's taking your courage and your um and your team uh you know, your vision for something and realizing it, that's the thing that always brings these other, um, these other big established kind of formulaic companies around to understanding, oh, there's a different way to present media. I think it's super cutting edge. I think it's super fun. And it's 100% inspiring to us as people who are creating content to see the same level of creativity and hard work kind of echoing back at us. It makes us feel super valid and good. Yeah. It's like very, it's community building too. Like people, it's like, you're not just having fun reading comics. You're having fun reading about reading the comics. It's like brings it to a whole nother level of engagement, you know? Yeah. I, I think something that we, I, I can speak for myself and I most of my team that we just want to do things that make us happy. And yes. my my element is bringing the weirdness. Like, I don't ever want to feel like I'm punching a clock with this stuff. Like, I have to do that at my regular job. Like, I don't, this is my outlet. So I feel you. Like, the whole idea of the mystery school being where you're not saying, like, Wonder Woman isn't a passion or things like that. But, like, you don't. Wonder Woman isn't yours yeah. at the end of the day. At the end of the day, like we have to put the toys back where we got them, you know, and make mm-hmm. sure, dust them off and make sure that they're in good shape for whoever comes along next. And There's a chance that the great eraser of continuity could drop squarely on our run. <laughs> and it'll be just something where I'm hanging on to old comps being like, I once did this thing. <laughs> Please read this. <laughs> Um, I do. I do have our big finale question. Great. Yes. If you had a Rube Goldberg machine, what would it do? Oh my god! 
Ooh. Oh, I'm so tired. Earlier, you, I, I got to do a full disclosure here. Dan had reached out to me and said, do you know what a Rube Gold, Goldberg machine is? I love the. I feel and, like I just uh, referenced one like a few days ago. <laughs> yeah. It, this is the type of thing that Becky and I love. And it's the type of thing that we annoy each other with all the time for for listeners or readers or however you're you're <laughs> taking this a rube goldberg machine is like a complex series of usually rudimentary devices that are made to do something usually like usually mundane mundane and also like <clears throat> like you're like a cat you're just following this ball that clinks into <laughs> things and makes noises and makes other things move there's a great one in logan airport in boston oh yeah most people would be familiar with like the kind of like a with a real like rudimentary version in the game mousetrap, mousetrap which is... never worked for me growing up i, I never, never was it. able to balance that damn basket you gotta balance the basket <laughs> I, never played it. I couldn't do it it would always just fall down it's like i'm never gonna catch any mouse at this point at this at this juncture so <laughs> the my rube goldberg machine I already know what mine does. I'm trying to Im- I'm trying to envision what you know what it does. I know what it does. That's it's, what I'm struggling. It's with. gonna make me coffee in the morning for sure. But that's the, oh. that's what I want. So you've got like the Pee Wee's Big Adventure type of thing. I never. I didn't like Pee Wee. Pee Wee scared me. Oh my goodness! <laughs> He's a couch. You would scream a if, you said it, if you said <laughs> <laughs> you it. If you said it, will start screaming. I require just, a divorce. It would put me on edge, and I never <laughs> liked it. Wow. Yeah, it was it made me anxious. Ooh. Knowing that there was a word that would set everybody off. The head didn't were the head in big the head in the box yeah, but I was think, another one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, See? Jombie the genie? It would scare me. <laughs> oh my goodness. So I never watched it because I was afraid of You didn't Pee-wee. like Pee-wee's Playhouse. I just was scared in general. But Pee-wee's Big Adventure, the film. I was scared. He does a thing in the morning. It's like a turntable goes and then a string gets He pulled. stole my idea. This and that happens. <laughs> I don't know that it makes coffee, but it made him cereal at least. Yeah, see, that's not what I'm about. That movie, um, <laughs> this is completely off kilter, but the his his like bully, like Pee Wee's neighborhood bully. Yeah. Um I, I saw that movie probably when I was a, when I was young and I didn't remember it, but the second time I saw it, I was old enough to realize that his bully was played by um, someone who played John Wayne Gacy Jr. in another oh movie. My so, God. Oh my wow! I um, <laughs> terrifying. I was like, oh, I guess we're bringing the clown to the neighborhood. <laughs> so scary. There are scary moments in Big Adventure when Large. She's like, "Tell him Large Marge sent you," and then she's got a crazy. <laughs> oh. Anyway, I can talk about Pee Wee's Big Adventure some other time. <laughs> right now, my Rube Goldberg machine, I don't think we need to explain exactly how it works, but there are certain things that take place in mind. A bowling ball rolls down a thing, That's it good. hits a thing, and a, and a chicken lays an egg. That's, the egg you gotta drops have into, a chicken laying the an chi- egg. But the chicken is a willing participant and is treated really well in the off-season. so well. <laughs> so well. And that egg... And if it doesn't want to lay the egg, we'll just... Have the a, egg is actually donated. Yeah. It's donated. It's donated. <laughs> it's not even an egg. It's a wooden. It's donated to a hungry dog's bowl. A, a dog shape. that needs some more luster in its fur. There you go. It lands in a dog bowl. That's what it is. My Rube Goldberg machine is just a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a chicken. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a chicken. It's just a little happy hen. That pecks and scratches and lays it. It's an well, and I want the bowling ball that hits the thing and makes the noise. And, and then that can make your coffee. That makes my coffee. With a percolator? Or yeah, with a French sure. press? Not a French press. Pour percolator. over? Percolator. My, yeah. Because we got to uh, have like 12 cups to make it through the day. How about your Rube Goldberg machine makes the coffee and mine will do the do the dishes? I love that. <laughs> Because I hate washing coffee mugs so much, and we can go I'll wash the coffee mugs. I didn't know that. We can go a day or two without doing the dishes, but the coffee mugs they got to get washed. They, they pile up. They pile up in the studio. Becky will have all of my favorite <laughs> mugs in there. And we I- have a great collection <laughs> of mugs, so yeah. that's it's very important every morning when you decide what mug you're going to use. That's going to be like your power mug for the day. Man, I love that Rube Goldberg thought. What's your what will your machine do, Dan? Yeah, we need to know. Um, so 
it, I cannot take credit for this part. This is Jake's question, my brother. Um, Love it. Mine is the sandwich one. This is his. And you would be surprised how many people don't know what a Rube Goldberg machine is. So I always have to explain it. And it's always kind of a nice um, kind of heats the pool up a little bit before you have the interview. Like, hey, do you know what a Rube Goldberg machine is? So the, the people know what they're getting into. Yeah. Oh, that's so smart. Cool. Um, yeah, I said the other day that it would launch my bed because I am <laughs> I am a person who like I was going to the gym for like months and then like one day I just didn't go and then I was like oh I can I can sleep in like yeah. that's a this possibility is way better than going to the gym oh, wait I don't have yeah. to go to the gym <laughs> I can just sleep in <laughs> yeah yeah it's like you get the feeling of like um, like you like did something very awesome and accomplished something, but then it's also like, I really love my bed yeah. Yeah. and like, it's great. Cause like sometimes my girlfriend is a teacher, so she still is teaching in person. Sometimes I'll roll over and it's not Scarlet, but it's Dinah who has now taken Scarlet's side of the bed. Yeah. So then I get to wake up to my, uh, one of my best friends. So who is um, also a nuisance, but yeah, that is, um, Someone asked me that the other day. The Rube Goldberg machine is a hard one for me. I think it's going to be the bed, but if I can think of something better, it'll change. So you can't hold me to that. Uh, yeah. Well, that's the great thing absolutes. about a Rube Goldberg machine is one little, you take that that bowling ball and you point it in the other direction and it cha- completely changes. There's a whole other machine, whole new machine on the other side. Whole new machine. <laughs> like this machine over here stabs me in the eye. Oh so my please God. don't point the bowling ball. This one, <laughs> this is very important. This way, is a coffee making machine this way an eye gouger <laughs> please don't i very specifically built this to do these two things <laughs> these are two of my favorite things if the coffee isn't working a good eye gouge gets me out of bed gets me up and moving <laughs> but don't do the eye gouge well, please where can people find you and your work uh i am uh if you're on social media twitter and instagram i'm becky clunan at both of those things yeah and i'm if you're on social medias of uh instagram and twitter i'm at michael w conrad i also have a web page mwconrad.com but i don't update it very often and together we have the web shop which is mysteryschool.bigcartel.com all of this stuff probably the best way to find it would be go to one of our social medias click on the link Go see the the neat stuff that we're making um, that isn't for a big company and only exists to maybe serve itself. Maybe it's a little weird. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a little weird. We got. But maybe maybe, maybe you're a little weird. So. Maybe you know what? I'm discovering everyone's a little bit weird. Everyone's and a little I love weird. it. I'm here for it. You can find us at Gatecrashers Pod on Twitter and Gatecrashers Fan on the internets. Catch you next week. Stupid, 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 stupid